Hello, good evening, everyone. Welcome to today's health talk uh, organized by 365 Cancer Prevention Society and Thompson Medical. I'm Emiko, your host for tonight. So I'll run through the flow for tonight's session. We have Madam Chan Chui En, who will be sharing with us her testimony. After which, we'll invite our main speaker, Dr. Chisha Kuo, who will be sharing with us about the topic on neurological cancers. We will also have a Q&A session at the end of the talk, so feel free to ask your questions at the comment section and we'll address them at the end of the talk. Do remember to like and share this Facebook Live. Also visit both of our social media sites for 365 Cancer Prevention Society as well as Thompson Medical Center. Kindly note that all information shared in this event by the speaker and 365 Cancer Prevention Society are for general information only and subjected to changes. So do consult your doctor for personalized and detailed medical advice. We have an ongoing campaign called My First Memo to encourage women who are 40 and above from low income backgrounds to go for a mammogram screening free of charge. This is important to help um, early detection for breast cancer. So you may show your support by donating via giving.sg. And you can also scan this QR code to find out more about the campaign. So my first memo is brought to you by 365 Cancer Prevention Society, Icon Cancer Center and Satacom Health. And here you can also see our other community partners. So just to give you a brief introduction of Don Thompson Surgical Center, they are located at Thompson Road within Thompson Medical Center, and they offer a wide range of services covering most major women conditions. So to find out more, you can actually scan this QR code. So to start off, I'll now invite Madam Chan to share her testimony with us. Thank you, Amiko. Hello, okay, Madam I'm Chan. Okay, Hi, so I'll pass the time over to you. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm Madam Chan. I'm a cancer survivor. Um, first and foremost, I would like to thank 365 Cancer Preven Prevention Society for giving me this opportunity to share with you my cancer journey. And uh, before I continue, uh, I would like to tell you a story. A true story. So one evening, while I was doing my laundry as usual, I kicked on a chair accidentally and I fell. I didn't fall sideways or backwards. I fell face down. And as a result of that, I sustained injury on my chest, uh, which led me to go and consult a doctor. And the doctor advised me to go for a chest x-ray. And a tumor showed up in the x-ray and I was referred to the lung specialist. And that was how my cancer journey began. So in February this year, I, I had a surgery to remove the tumor. Uh, the surgery was tough, but... Uh, it was tolerable. Um, however, uh, the chemotherapy was a really, really big challenge for me. I experienced all sorts of side effects, such as nausea, diarrhea, constipation, difficulty sleeping, fatigue, weight loss, as well as hair loss. However, I kept reminding myself, whatever I was going through was temporary. And I chose to focus on the healing and also the recovery. Um, today, I have completed my chemotherapy and I went for the scan and the scan showed that there's no evidence of cancer. Uh, so now currently, I am on cancer drug long-term as a long-term treatment. Um, I just want to share with everybody that um, during this time, um, it was very tough. 
on top of the support that I got from my daughter and my friends, I joined the 365 Cancer Prevention Society and I'm really very grateful for the support as well as the help that was given. In particular, the weekly uh, online Zoom lessons, uh, the detox exercise, uh, the Zumba, the line dance, and then the nutritional workshop, um, the Kopi Talk, uh, particularly I benefited most from the counseling session where uh, I'm taught to break things down uh, and take a different perspective. And uh, during Kopi Talk, um, I get to meet and interact with fellow cancer warriors and I'm really very encouraged um, by, by how they brave and fight cancer. So although I know that this cancer journey is not going to be easy, however, 365 has taught me that no one fights cancer alone and very, very grateful that um, 365 is here to support us. So please don't give up. Uh, there are help and support available to each and every one of us. So uh, with that, I thank you for uh, listening to my sharing. Uh, and now I would like to pass the time back to Amiko. Amiko, please. Thank you, Madam Chan, for your sharing. And we hope that uh, Madam Chan's testimony was encouraging for you. Yeah. So do know that you are not alone and that we are here to support you. So for the next section, we'll be inviting our main speaker, Dr. Chisha Kuo, who is a consultant neurologist at Thomson Surgical Center. And she will be sharing with us about being clear on urological cancers. So urological cancers are growth of abnormal cells that form in the organs of the urinary tract in both men and women, in areas such as the bladder, kidneys, and prostate in men, with prostate cancer being the third most prevalent cancer among men in Singapore. So tonight we will be finding out on more, uh, more on how to identify symptoms and when it is a cause for concern. So without further ado, I'll now invite Dr. Trisha up for her sharing. Hi, Amigo. Hello, Dr. Trisha. So I'll now pass Hi. the time over to you. Thank you very much. Thanks for the kind introduction. And uh, before I start, I just want to express my admiration um, at Medicha's bravery in sharing her journey with cancer with us this evening. Um, it's certainly not easy to go through all this, especially with COVID-19 and multiple trips to the hospital that are required. So I'm sure that all of you will join me in expressing our gratitude to her for her open sharing. Um, so let me introduce myself. I'm Dr. Trisha Kua. I'm a consultant neurologist. Uh, and that's a specialist that deals with treatment of any illnesses that uh, involve the urinary tract for both men and women. And we do uh, give medications as well as do surgery for any uh, illnesses in the urinary tract as well. So for the purposes of today's talk, I'll be focusing on urological cancers. And I thought I would talk a bit about what to do about uh, if there's any discovery of any blood in someone's urine. And that is a quite a common pickup sometimes when we go for health screening. So as mentioned earlier, there's a bit of a disclaimer. Um, the following lecture is uh, for general information and educational purposes. There is uh, some sensitive information, sensitive slides and images. So this talk is really intended for an audio audience. So some viewer discretion is advised. So here is the outline for my subsequent slides. I'll first talk about the introduction to urological or urinary health. What are the types of cancers? Uh, what are the symptoms? How are they treated? And I especially want to focus on the last bit of the talk, which is a special topic of cancer survivorship, and then sub conclude with some take-home messages. So what is the urinary system? Well, the urinary system consists of uh, two kidneys, two ureters, a bladder, and then a urethra. So our kidneys work hard to filter excess water and waste to make urine of pee. Uh, and then the urine travels down the ureters into the bladder. The bladder then acts like a reservoir. It will hold the pee until it's full. And then someone will, and then we'll get a sensation of wanting to pass urine. Um, so what is different between men and women is that men do have extra organs in the urinary tract. They have the prostate, testes, as well as the reproductive organs. So here's a side view picture to show you the differences in the lower urinary system and the urinary tract when it comes to men and women. 
So as I mentioned earlier, men do have a different urinary system. We, they have uh, extra organs, such as the prostate, which I've uh, shown in the blue color box, as you can see here. And they also have a longer pee pipe or a urethra, whereas women tend to have a shorter pee pipe or a urethra as well. Uh, also in the pelvis, uh, women have the womb, the uterus, and then uh, the intestines at the back. So that's the difference between the men and urinary uh, men, men, the urinary system for men and uh, women. Uh, what exactly is the prostate? It is found in all men. It is a walnut-sized gland that is uh, located between the bladder and the urethra or the pee pipe. And the function of the prostate is to nourish and transport the sperm. What is cancer exactly? Well, it's a mutation. So I think we're quite familiar with this word nowadays because uh, the news has been talking about mutations for COVID-19. Uh, mutation essentially is a change in the structure or DNA of the cells. And unfortunately, this causes abnormal cells to form and occasionally can form a cancerous tumor. Um, cancers of the urinary tract or what we call urological cancers can be linked to various risk factors, can be environmental, lifestyle or genetic or others. And over the years, fortunately, the methods for detecting and treating urological cancers have improved vastly. So our patients now have a wide range of uh, treatment options as well to suit their goals and needs. So there are some cancers that can occur in the urinary system of both men and women, and these are bladder cancer as well as kidney or renal cancer. Whereas there are some cancers that are specific to men, so I've put those pictures on the right-hand side to show you, such as prostate cancer, testicular cancer, as well as lassi penile cancer as well. Here are some of the environmental risk factors. Unfortunately, smoking is a very important risk factor for all urological cancers, particularly uh, kidney as well as bladder cancer. Uh, but we also know from um, information in the past that uh, it's not just the urological cancer. Smoking is bad for uh, the lungs as well. So if you, so you do smoke or you know someone who smokes, uh, please try to stop or at least try and cut down. In Singapore, prostate cancer is the third most common cancer in men. It tends to occur more frequently in people with a family history, uh, those with a high uh, fat diet or those that are older. Uh, we know that statistically, more than 70% of prostate cancer cases are diagnosed in men older than 65 uh, years of age. And in contrast, uh, there are some cancers that are very rare. So for example, penile cancer is extremely rare, fortunately. It accounts for less than 1% of cancers in men. Uh, it's also related to older age, uh, such as, uh, and also viruses such as the human papilloma viruses, um, lack of circumcision, as well as uh, infection and poor hygiene. Testicular cancer, which is uh, something you may have heard of, uh, also usually develops in, um, in men. It's uh, only in men, I beg your pardon, uh, but it's, it's strangely in, in younger men, in men who are aged uh, between 15 to 35 years of age. And strangely, it's on the rise, although we don't really know what is the cause for testicular cancer. Um, other medical conditions can also be risk factors for cancer, such as uh, polycystic kidney disease for kidney cancer and chronic inflammation for bladder cancer. And a small proportion or percentage of these cancers can be inherited. So what are the symptoms for cancer? Well, one common symptom uh, is uh, what we call painless gross hematuria or visible blood in the urine. Um, unfortunately, uh, all, some of the time, symptoms don't really happen until the cancer has become more advanced. So whenever someone has uh, some symptoms, such as what we call a painless gross hematuria, then that warrants uh, early testing and investigation to see whether or not there's any underlying issues. So blood in the urine uh, is, can be a symptom of any of the urological cancers, such as bladder, kidney, as well as prostate cancer. And the rest of the symptoms will depend on the stage of the cancer. So if the cancer has spread to the other parts of the body, such as the bones, then someone may develop a pelvic or back pain. Um, certain cancers may also have other symptoms, such as uh, prostate cancer patients, because of the location of the prostate within the urinary system, it's just below the bladder, as I showed you in the diagram earlier, can also present with problems with urination as well as uh, sexual function for a man. So uh, prostate cancer, uh, unfortunately, can be asymptomatic. And so it helps to go for uh, health screening and also see a doctor early if someone has symptoms. Um, so symptoms of prostate cancer can be very similar to symptoms of prostate enlargement or what we call BPH. Um, and that includes frequent urination, increased urination at night. Uh, that's called nocturia. Uh, difficulty in maintaining a steady stream of urine. Uh, so that means a poor flow, uh, having to strain to pass urine or uh, starting and stopping or having to stand for a long time before the urine flow starts. 
uh, it can also present with uh, blood and urine, painful urination, uh, sometimes erectile dysfunction. And as I mentioned earlier, if the cancer unfortunately has progressed to involve the bones, uh, can present with back pain. And if the bones uh, are such that uh, um, it's so involved that they are pressing on the nerves, uh, someone can also present uh, with weakness and swelling of the lower limbs as well. Uh, so for the different types of cancers, I'll just uh, briefly go through what are the other possible symptoms. So, so for the rarer cancers like testicular and penile cancer, someone may notice a lump under the skin or swelling. Um, generally, any uh, cancer can present with uh, weight loss, uh, loss of appetite as well as fatigue. A lot of times these cancers are detected during a routine examination of the, the tummy or the, the genitals, including uh, during a health screening. So back to this blood and the urine business, uh, because a lot of us go for health screening nowadays, uh, do, I, does, do you need to worry if there is uh, blood in the urine? Um, well, we usually categorize blood and the urine into two big categories, what we call microscopic hematuria uh, or gross hematuria. So microscopic means that it's uh, not visible to the naked eye, whereas uh, gross hematuria visibly looks uh, red. Um, and the reason why we try and differentiate between these two big categories is because the approach can, is actually quite different. So microscopic hematuria means that it can only be seen under the microscope and is defined by the laboratory usually as more than three red blood cells in the high power field when the, uh, the uh, laboratory looks at it under the microscope. And it's a very common condition. Uh, it, it can affect up to 2 to 30% of the population. So this is why these uh, two categories are so different. Uh, for those who have microscopic hematuria, you can heave a sigh of relief uh, because only uh, statistically 3 to 5% of people with uh, microscopic hematuria will have a urological cancer versus 35% uh, of people with uh, visible or gross hematuria can have possibly an underlying cancer. And therefore, uh, a visible or gross hematuria warrants a more detailed testing and investigations because of the higher risk of detecting cancer or malignancy. So for those patients with uh, microscopic hematuria, I would usually, if I see them in my clinic, uh, take a good history uh, and look for any possible contributing benign causes. Benign means non-cancerous. Um, all these are possible contributing factors, as you can see here, exercise, dehydration, sexual activity, trauma, menstruation. And uh, if we're not sure whether this is a, a true microscopic hematuria, we can always repeat the urine test again at least 20, uh, 48 hours after the cessation of the previous activity. So uh, in terms of uh, causes to investigate for blood in the urine, typically we will look for these three big causes, uh, urinary tract infection, stones, as well as prostate enlargement in a man. And subsequent tests and investigations will depend on whether this hematuria is visible or non-visible. And we'll also look for risk factors for cancer, such as smoking. So just to let you know and show you how difficult it can be sometimes to differentiate between the different types of uh, uh, cancers, uh, these are the signs and symptoms of a, someone with urine infection. And if you look at this, this is, sounds very similar or exactly the same, in fact, to the symptoms that someone might have if they have cancer. The only difference may be being fever, nausea, vomiting, and therefore, uh, that's why uh, we do need to consider some investigations or some tests when it comes to investigating whether or not uh, someone has cancer if they have blood in the urine. Um, so some of these possible tests uh, will be streamlined according to what are a person's risk factors, such as whether they are smokers or not. Uh, certainly, if someone is a smoker, then we'll advocate uh, doing more tests, unfortunately. So it's a good idea to stop smoking. Um, for some of these tests, includes a scope for the bladder or a telescope check for the bladder. This is called a cystoscopy. So this is using a tool with a tiny light or camera to check the urine passageway for growth and tumors. Uh, if we do a scope for the ureter, that is called a ureteroscopy. We also usually will do blood tests to look in the changes in the blood uh, that can be signed, indicates whether or not there are signs of cancer or infection. And generally, whenever there is blood in the urine, we'll always do some sort of scan. So there are a variety of scans that are available, including MRI, X-ray, ultrasound, and CT scans. And the choice of the scan will depend on someone's risk factors for cancer as well. Um, lastly, if we do think that there might be something abnormal, especially if we see something uh, on the CT scan, uh, we might consider doing a biopsy to get a sample of tissue and analyze it for cancer cells. So I'll just show you some of the uh, scans and the ways that we detect uh, cancer. So for example, kidney cancer, uh, it is absolutely essential to do some sort of scan. There is unfortunately no blood test or tumor marker for kidney cancer as yet. Uh, although there's a lot of research that's going into uh, this at the moment. 
Um, so these are all the variety of scans available to look for kidney cancer. Uh, there's an ultrasound scan on the far left-hand corner. You can see that the yellow arrow is pointing to an irregular shape there. That's a, a growth. Um, the CT scan is very clear. You can see that there's a growth there. Uh, whereas the MRI scan um, is a lot more detailed, but it often requires a, a, a very highly skilled and trained radiologist to interpret uh, MRI scan. Um, the nice thing about MRI and ultrasound is that there's no X-ray exposure, whereas the CT scan does have X-ray exposure. But uh, routinely, a lot of times, our first test is either ultrasound or a CT scan to get enough details. This is what the scope looks like. So this is a, a two pictures that uh, I put there to show you. So this is how a cystoscope or a bladder scope is done for a man and a lady. Um, it's a telescope check for the bladder and it can be done actually quite safely under local anesthesia with some lignocaine gel. Uh, sedation is optional. And uh, what we are looking for is the pictures that are put on, up on the right hand side. That is what a bladder tumor looks like when we look into the bladder using the scope. Okay, so uh, moving on to the next common uh, uh, situation that um, some people might occur uh, when they go for health screening is uh, when they do tumor markers and specifically for urological or urinary issues, some uh, men may be affected by this uh, raised uh, PSA. So PSA doesn't stand for Port of Authority Singapore, it uh, stands for Prostate Specific Antigen and it's a blood test, it's a tumor marker. And it's actually a protein that's produced by the prostate gland to nourish uh, the sperm. Um, so whenever someone has a raised PSA, this is what I usually will go through with my patients in the clinic. It doesn't always mean that someone has prostate cancer, fortunately, but it means that someone probably has a prostate problem. So it could be a prostate inflammation or infection, uh, or what we call a urinary tract infection. Uh, it could be due to uh, enlarged prostate, or lastly, of course, could be due to prostate cancer as well. And unfortunately, although this PSA test is very specific for prostate problems, it's it's, uh, it's not sensitive enough to distinguish between the various causes. And so that's why the doctor it has to do several other tests when uh, someone comes with a raised PSA to the clinic. So the first thing to do is a digital rectal examination, which I've shown you with this picture. So with a glove finger with a lot of gel, we will usually uh, feel for the back of the prostate through the intestine and make sure that there's no nodules and no hard uh, growth. Next thing, usually what the urologist would do is an ultrasound scan. So this can be done through the tummy. And I've shown you um, an ultrasound scan on the bottom left-hand corner. And uh, this shows uh, by the dimensions uh, indicated and someone with an enlarged uh, prostate of 58 so mils or 58 cc's. Um, and uh, uh, this can account possibly sometimes for a slightly elevated uh, PSA as well. Uh, so what is interesting is that as time has gone by, I think men, we've gotten wiser and more research. We've realized that actually there is no single um, normal PSA level where previously, if you look at the test results, the laboratory will give a cutoff of uh, four nanograms per mil as what is within a normal limit. But now doctors are increasingly recognizing that there's no such thing as a normal PSA value. And this is the reason why uh, these risk calculators are readily available on the internet. So as you can see here, I've used the European-based uh, one. Uh, even with a PSA level of 1, there is approximately a 6% risk of prostate cancer. Uh, however, if someone has a very high PSA level of 10, then the risk of cancer increases significantly to 42%. So it's not that someone who has a, um, a PSA level less than 4 doesn't have cancer. It means that the risk of cancer is much lower. So the, in terms of assessing someone with a high PSA, we look at the likelihood of someone having enlarged prostate based on the digital rectal examination and the bedside ultrasound, the likelihood of uh, infection based on someone's symptoms, and also uh, factors like uh, what the absolute PSA level is. And we can also use additional blood tests called PSA derivatives, such as free and total PSA, PHI, uh, PSA velocity, and PSA doubling time. So all these are the tools that are available to the urologist. Uh, if we think that someone unfortunately might have a high risk of prostate cancer, then we proceed on to the next uh, stage, which is doing an MRI scan. So this is increasingly the standard of care nowadays. Uh, with a MRI scan, we use it very much similarly to how we use a mammogram to screen for breast cancer. We're looking for suspicious areas in the prostate so that we can do what we call a targeted MRI fusion prostate biopsy. So what is the MRI targeted fusion biopsy of the prostate? Well, essentially the MRI scan will be fused with uh, live uh, ultrasound images in real time 
And using this, uh, the urologist and the radiologist can precisely target the suspicious areas that need to be focused on and biopsy those areas uh, more adequately. But why is the doctor ordering so many scans? That's a question that a lot of my patients ask me, actually. Um, and uh, more often than not, I have to explain to them. Uh, that's because you want to see more clearly. I wish I had x-ray vision and microscope eyes, but unfortunately, I don't. Um, and sometimes to assess whether or not the cancer has spread to other parts of the body, we are obliged to get all these other scans that you can see here. So, for example, a bone scan to look for spread to the bones, a CT scan to look whether they're spread to the liver, and uh, also a CT lung to see whether it's spread to the lungs. Uh, but fortunately, technology is advancing nowadays so much that uh, we can, uh, in exchange for getting so many scans that you saw on the previous uh, PowerPoint slide, we can consider getting PET scans nowadays to substitute for all the three scans that you saw earlier. So how are cancers treated? Well, of course, prevention is better than cure. Uh, please try and take more antioxidants, fruits and vegetables, reduce amounts of uh, oily food and salt in the diet. Uh, for some, actually, the workplace uh, may and be a source of potential harmful substances. So these are all the possible chemicals that can be related to an increased risk of cancer. Uh, potentially for bladder cancer, uh, it's an increased exposure to um, uh, dyes and benzene, and th these can cause increased risk of uh, bladder cancer. So always follow safety protocols at work and avoid direct contact with uh, these dangerous materials. Um, so the treatment of, of, of uh, urological cancers in general depends on several factors. It depends on the type of cancer, the grade, and also the stage. Uh, and of course, the patient's preference does matter as well. Uh, common uh, broad categories of uh, options available includes uh, surgery, chemotherapy, radiotherapy, and nowadays uh, immunotherapy is also increasingly used. So immunotherapy is a little bit different from chemotherapy. It boosts the immune system to fight disease. So this is an example of how kidney cancers can be treated. Um, we can either remove part of the, the kidney itself, the part where the tumor is, uh, but uh, if the growth is rather huge, then unfortunately, you might have to remove the entire kidney. That's called a radical nephrectomy. Uh, fortunately, if the other kidney, the, because we have two kidneys, if the other kidney is functioning well, removal of the entire one kidney doesn't usually affect uh, overall kidney function. Uh, sometimes in rare, in rare cases where we're not sure whether it's infection versus a tumor, we can consider doing a biopsy before surgery. Kidney cancers can also usually be treated uh, laparoscopically, i.e. Uh, keyhole surgery or robotic surgery nowadays, the aim of which is to reduce the scar size, reduce wound pain, and to enable faster healing. Uh, this is a well-known Da Vinci robot that a lot of surgeons uh, use nowadays. There's a picture on the left-hand side. And with the robot, we can achieve uh, precise movements as well as uh, stitching. So after the removal of the kidney tumor, as you can see on the picture on the right-hand side, uh, using the robot, uh, we are able to uh, close the, the gap uh, in the kidney that is left behind, and that uh, will restore normal function better as well. Same, prostate cancer is usually treated uh, with robotic surgery nowadays. That's the most common uh, way, uh, provided that the prostate cancer hasn't spread outside of the prostate to the bones and the liver and the lung. Uh, the other options for someone who has prostate cancer that is confined to the prostate is uh, radiotherapy, as well as uh, what we call active surveillance. Um, lastly, you may have heard of things like cryotherapy and high food for the prostate, but these are usually done in the context of a clinical trial in our local population. So a lot of patients usually ask me what does robotic surgery look like, so I've decided to put together a short video to show you. So it's not the robot that's doing the surgery, it's still the surgeon. And the re reason why um, the movements are a lot more precise when we use a robot, as you can see here, is uh, the uh, controls in the robotic console itself will translate to all these minute uh, movements in the robot arms as well. So you can see that's how stitching is done. And the surgeon is not sitting far away from the patient. The surgeon is sitting just next to the patient and concentrating on the surgery at the console, as you can see here. So what about uh, bladder cancer? Uh, bladder cancer also can be treated with uh, keyhole surgery. Um, and this is called this surgery is called a transurethral resection of the bladder tumor. Um, this is how the surgery is done. It's done with a bladder scope, and uh, we can put an electric loop through the scope itself that you can see here. And current is passed through this electric loop to allow the surgeon to cut through the tissue itself in a very safe and controlled manner to minimize the risk of bleeding. So you can see for very small bladder tumors or cancers, we can resect the whole entire tumor very safely 
in a very controlled manner. And if this is a if this is a small tumor, fortunately, this is curative. Um, and using this, we can stage the tumor as well because we can look at how deep the tumor is. Uh, unfortunately, for larger cancers, uh, it's not curative, particularly if the cancer is very invasive through the wall of the uh, bladder itself. So this is how, uh, uh, what we call a TURBT operation, uh, how it's done. So it's done uh, under spinal or general anesthesia, as you can see. Okay, so um, treatment for better cancer, as I mentioned earlier, it depends on the stage and the grade. If it's superficial, uh, we can resect the whole thing. Unfortunately, if it's a deep or muscle invasive uh, bladder cancer, uh, then we'll have to consider other treatments as well, which I'll tell you in a short while. If it's a deeper cancer, uh, then we will consider putting medications into the bladder. Um, so these medications are either immunotherapy or chemotherapy. And uh, the reason why we do this is that uh, these uh, uh, medications have been shown to reduce the risk of uh, tumor spreading as well as uh, progression. That means the tumor uh, growing further into the muscle wall of the bladder itself. So interestingly, one of the immunotherapy medications used is BCG, which uh, as you're all familiar with, was used uh, to immunize us against TB when we were younger. Um, the other agent that we use uh, as a chemotherapy is uh, mitomycin C. Uh, so this is instilled into the bladder once a week for uh, six weeks. Unfortunately, if the tumor or the growth has invaded through the wall of the bladder itself, then um, a person that is affected by this will need a, a removal, of, removal of the entire bladder itself. So that's called a radical uh, cystectomy. Uh, if that's the case, we will reconstruct uh, the urine passageway. Uh, the ureters will be joined to a piece of small intestine uh, that we call an ideal conduit, and that is uh, put out um, into the uh, skin, and opening into the skin, and that allows the urine to drain into a urine bag. For the other urological cancers, for example, for testicular and penile cancer, nowadays uh, where there is an emphasis on maintaining organ function and sexual function as uh, much as possible, uh, after the tumor is removed, a lot of times there is option to rebuild or reconstruct uh, into a, a normal, uh, or resemble a normal uh, a situation or anatomy for the patient. Um, erectile dysfunction, for example, can be restored with both medicines and surgery and uh, reproductive function can be preserved with uh, sperm banking. So just for interest sake, I'll show you what a testicular prosthesis looks like. So not just uh, a breast uh, uh, prosthesis for ladies who have had breast cancer, there is testicular prosthesis available for men with uh, testicular cancer as well. So it's also made out of silicon and uh, it can be implanted into men, uh, not just those who have lost a testicle due to uh, cancer, for those who have lost a testicle due to a previous trauma or injury as well. So usually when it comes to treating patients with cancer, it's a multidisciplinary approach. Uh, so you have the surgeons, the urological surgeons, the radiation oncologists, uh, medical oncologists, pathologists, radiologists, all collaborate to uh, offer uh, personalized uh, world-class uh, care. Um, for those who are worried about uh, coming to the hospital during this uh, current flare of COVID-19 cases, uh, quite often, we have uh, teleconsultation uh, services available as well. These are online virtual visits. Um, please uh, uh, note that um, any delay in diagnosis may alter the, the treatment options that are available. So please don't hesitate to seek medical attention if you have any symptoms. So I just want to focus the last bit of my talk on cancer survivorship. Um, and um, this is uh, something special that we recognize is an important part of recovery from cancer. So this represents the journey of being cancer-free for someone who has had treatment, but somehow still affected by uh, either emotional, psychosocial, or physical issues from the cancer itself. And the uh, focus is on um, living beyond uh, the cancer months and years later. So this is uh, why you want to join a support group because of all these benefits. It uh, improves the uh, surveillance for recurrence, uh, allows you to get psychosocial support and sometimes they have programs to screen for secondary cancers as well. So um, we are able, because of support groups, to provide uh, talks such as this, which provides uh, health education for uh, the general public. Uh, you also get information or access to other programs as well, like physiotherapy, exercises. And uh, with more information, I think um, uh, generally one would feel a lot more empowered. 
So let me just use prostate cancer as an example to show you uh, what the journey beyond the treatment of uh, uh, removal of the prostate is like. So just to refresh your memory, I showed this slide earlier about robotic surgery uh, to treat uh, uh, prostate cancer, uh, which is a common treatment that is used nowadays. So after the prostate gland is removed for someone with prostate cancer, unfortunately, there are some vital structures that are nearby that can contribute to someone having issues after that. So potentially, uh, after treatment, someone may have uh, something called stress urinary incontinence. And that's because the muscles and the nerves that are located uh, nearby may be um, either involved by the cancer or uh, damaged during the uh, surgery itself. So stress incontinence is uh, any inadvertent urine leakage with exertion for example, laughing, coughing, sneezing, or exercise like playing badminton. Um, these are where the nerves are located in the picture I've shown you on the uh, top here. And the sphincter muscle or the bladder door muscle is located just below the prostate. And hence, uh, after removal of the prostate, the sphincter may be uh, injured or weaker after the surgery. And hence, uh, there may be an inadvertent leakage of urine. Then there's uh, exertion such as coughing, sneezing, carrying heavy things, or exercise. So the first thing to do is to strengthen the sphincter by doing pelvic floor exercises or Kegel exercises. So these are not just relevant for females, uh, uh, ladies, it's relevant for men as well. And if that doesn't work, then uh, we move on to consider whether or not someone needs uh, further treatment such as surgery. Uh, a lot of times, uh, surgery for um, stress incontinence for men after prostate uh, treatment is done uh, at least six, six months to one year later and someone must have a stable disease, including their post-operative uh, PSA levels. So nowadays, these are the common treatments that are available. This is called a male sling. Uh, so we do this by placing a special plastic uh, material just below the, uh, the, uh, the bulb of the urethra, just below where the prostate was. And then we pull that up uh, on both sides, and that provides better support uh, for the urinary tract itself, the urethra, and that reduces the amount of leakage uh, for the patients. So I'll show you how this sling works. I've got a video. So this is a picture of the surgery. Uh, and then when the surgeon pulls out the sling on both sides, uh, because there are two arms of the sling, you can see that uh, through the telescope view uh, on the video itself, there is a better support, what we call uh, a closure or coaptation of the urinary passageway or the urethra. So that's how we are able to achieve uh, continence or maintain dryness for someone who has mild to moderate uh, leakage of urine after prostate uh, removal. So this sling is suitable for those with mild to moderate leakage. For example, just someone who is wearing one to three pads a day, uh, who is generally dry at night. Uh, unfortunately, it's uh, not suitable for those who've had radiation uh, for the prostate together with uh, the um, prostatectomy um, and because uh, the coaptation or the closure may not be as good. Uh, if someone has severe urine leakage, then we consider putting in other things. So this is called uh, artificial urinary sphincter. This is a very special hydraulic device that's got three components. It's got a cuff, a balloon or a reservoir, and then a control pump. So the cuff goes around the P-pipe or the urethra, as you can see on the picture on the right-hand side. Uh, the reservoir goes next to the balloon. And then lastly, this uh, control pump goes into the scrotum itself. So when someone wants to pee, if they have this device, all they have to do is press the control pump. Uh, then the water that's in this uh, cuff is, looks very much like a blood pressure cuff. Um, the water goes through the pump and then it goes uh, into the reservoir so that the cuff can be open and someone can pee. So I'll, I'll say that again. So the cuff is filled with water, it closes the urethra. When someone wants to pee, they squeeze the, the pump itself to move the fluid uh, from the cuff into the pump and into the balloon and that allows uh, the cuff to be open and someone to pee. Now of course a video uh, best demonstrates this so this is what happens when you press the pump. The cuff is not so full of fluid, it uh, opens up the urine passageway uh, and then uh, someone is able to pee and then after that uh, the fluid will flow backwards in this special hydraulic device, it's called artificial urinary sphincter and gradually the urethra or the pee pipe will close back again as the fluid flows backwards uh, from the reservoir in, back into the cuff itself. So this is meant for people with uh, severe urine leakage uh, after uh, uh, prostate surgery. So you don't have to put up with it if someone has all these issues. Uh, that's the key message in cancer survivorship. There is certainly help available, there are options available. 
um, you do have to come and see a healthcare professional uh, for us to assess and to see which option is better for you. So you can see that the urethra is closing back slowly again. So this gives someone a lot of time actually to go and empty out their bladder. So if you give it a few more seconds, it's going to close entirely. There you go. And therefore, that's how someone is able to maintain dryness. Okay, so for take-home messages, um, urological cancers or urinary cancers is an umbrella term for cancers of the bladder, kidney, penis, prostate, and testicles. Um, symptoms depend on the type of cancer, but certainly uh, can include uh, common symptoms such as a change in urination, sexual function, blood in the urine. Um, and sometimes all these are picked up when someone goes for health screening as well, such as having a raised PSA. Um, treatment includes the broad categories of surgery, radiation, uh, chemotherapy, and sometimes immunotherapy. Uh, early detection is key because if we discover something at an early stage, usually it's curable. Uh, please uh, know that help is available. So I'm happy to take any questions and uh, back to you, Aniko. Okay, thank you, Dr. Trisha, for your insightful sharing. We have now come to the Q&A session of our um, uh, Facebook Live today. So feel free to ask your questions in the comment section. But maybe just to start, um, Dr. Trisha, so there is a few questions, um, but maybe I'll just start with one. Um, at what age do you think we should start our health screening? Do we Should we go for health screening and or should we go for cancer screening? Uh, how many times a year should we go? And um, yeah, so, so what, what is your take on this question? Uh, I think it's a rather tricky question to answer because uh, the, the different cancers uh, do have different guidelines as to when to start uh, health screening. Um, but generally, um, if, if certainly if someone has a family history of cancer, I would uh, advise to uh, start health screening in the uh, uh, middle age, maybe around uh, 40 or 45 years old. Um, and uh, so, for example, if someone who has a, a father who has prostate cancer or grandfather who has prostate cancer, um, then I would suggest that this man uh, go and get a PSA test done at 40 years of age, actually. So increasingly, we recognize that um, if the, we can do, we do pick up the signs earlier and earlier. Um, mm. Certainly, doing a PSA doesn't always immediately lead to a uh, scary diagnosis of cancer. As I showed earlier in my slides, uh, even if you do have a normal PSA, a lot of the times you will take it in the context of the individual person. Um, mm. And there are scans that we can do before we like go straight and do a scary biopsy. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay, so let's say if it's a case where I suspect that I have urological cancer, who should I see? Uh, can I go to a GP or polytechnic or do I need to go to a urologist? Yeah, I think that's a, thanks for asking. That's a very common uh, question for the general public. Um, so if you're not sure about your symptoms, if they are very vague, then I think the best person to go to first is usually the GP or the polyclinic because uh, then they will be able to direct you to the appropriate specialist. Um, however, if you are very clear about your symptoms, uh, for example, there is obviously a pinkish urine or blood in the urine that you can see, then uh, it's definitely okay to come straight to the specialist such as a urologist to get the medical attention. Um, so it depends on the scenario as well. Okay, thank you. Okay, so another question. Um, are there any side effects from cytoscopy and biopsy? Hmm. Uh, okay, yes. Uh, well, it depends on whether or not uh, it's just a scope to look uh, uh, or is a scope plus a biopsy. So mm -hmm. uh, a lot of times when we screen uh, for the bladder for bladder cancer, when we are doing uh, just a cystoscopy, it is a very simple diagnostic scope. So there is no biopsy that is routinely done. Uh, if that's the case, um, just a simple look within the bladder itself is, is actually very uh, safe and the risks are very minimal. Um, common risk with doing a, a gentle scope for the bladder is um, risk of urine infection as well as a slight risk of bleeding, particularly if there is a small scratch in the urine passageway when we put the scope in. But even then, a small scratch usually will just heal by itself. Uh, there might be mm. a small amount of blood for like one or two days and then it just disappears. So a uh, screening scope for the bladder or a diagnostic scope without a biopsy is uh, extremely safe. I would say 90% of the time, there are no risk or side effects. Okay. Um, so actually, if, if, if let's say we have surgery, um, can you describe what the recovery from surgery will be like? Uh, maybe how mm. long or 
are there any things we need to take note of? Mm, okay. Well, uh, so there are several factors that uh, affect someone's uh, healing uh, after they've had surgery. So um, it's important to get good nutrition uh, when someone is recovering from the surgery. Um, so it's, uh, you know, um, quite often, uh, this is a discussion that, that generally most people will ask the doctor, what can I eat after my, my operation? So um, so it depends on your personal beliefs, uh, but certainly foods that are high in protein are good for recovery. Uh, we also try and get people to stop smoking before surgery itself because undergoing even a brief general anesthesia is putting uh, some strain on your heart and lungs. And um, uh, it's like almost running a short marathon. So if you want to have a fast recovery, uh, please uh, try and stop smoking before the surgery itself. Um, and then subsequently, um, after the surgery, it, uh, it really depends on uh, wound care to prevent wound infection. So keep the wounds as clean as possible. A lot of times, uh, doctors will prescribe antibiotics uh, to prevent wound infection. So uh, be compliant and remember to take your medications. Um, in terms of wound pain, if it's a keyhole surgery, fortunately, the wounds are a lot less painful. But even then, it helps to take the painkillers regularly for the first uh, two to three days. And then subsequently, you can tail down your painkillers uh, once the pain is much less. Okay. Uh, when it comes to wound healing, is it true that we should avoid seafood after surgery? Yeah, that was, that was what I was alluding to, Amiko. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, it depends on your personal cultural beliefs. Uh, I um, am fine with whatever my patients uh, choose. Um, yeah, so it, it, some people do believe that eating seafood prawns may increase the risk of wound infections. Um, mm. So if you, you believe that, I, I encourage you to eat other types of protein. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so just now you mentioned smoking. So there was actually a mm. question. Um, are there other causes um, that would increase risk of prostate cancer if, let's say, um, this patient does not smoke, but they do have, uh, they did have the diagnosis of getting prostate cancer? Yeah, um, fortunately, uh, yeah, a healthy diet which is rich in uh, fatty, oily food, uh, low in antioxidants, uh, tends to increase the risk of mm. prostate cancer. Yeah, so uh, it's very hard to avoid in Singapore. We all love our food. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Um. So yeah. Okay. So let's see. Like, what are the chances that cancer will come back? If uh, is there anything that I can look for, like cancer remission, any signs mm. and symptoms? Mm. So it depends on the individual cancer itself. Uh, a lot of times our follow up does involve doing blood tests and scans. Um, so just listen to your doctor and uh, um, and the the usually there's a protocol to follow for uh, how many scans or tests to be done within a certain period of time. So initially, after the first diagnosis, usually the scans and the checks are a lot more frequent, and then. Gradually, as uh, we uh, we know that as one or two years pass, the chance of recurrence is less. We tend to space out the follow up as well as the scans. So, uh, mm -hmm. for example, if uh, it's someone with kidney cancer, after a few years, uh, we will usually do just do a CT scan of the abdomen or the tummy once a year, and as well as a chest X-ray once a year a lot of times. But the caveat is that it depends on the original stage and the grade of the cancer itself. Great means how aggressive the cancer originally was. So if it's a, mm -hmm. originally a very aggressive cancer, then we tend to be a bit more kiasu and kiasi and scan a lot more frequently. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Okay. So um, as a urologist, how many subspecialties are there and what kind of treatments do they do? <laughs> I guess it's also a very frequently asked question and uh, how come a female doctor is a urologist? <laughs> that's, the other, <laughs> that's the other common question that I usually get. Uh, yeah, so there are male and female urologists. We see both male and female patients. Uh, we have a lot of smart specialization within urology itself. Um, I, in fact, I didn't discover this until medical school. It was something that I wasn't mm. aware of at all. Mm. Um, so all the different specialties in um, urology, of course, includes the most famous, which is oncology. Um, and then there's an uh, endo-urologist who specialize in stones. Uh, myself, I specialize in uh, functional female urology as well as reconstructive urology. Um, and then uh, there are those who specialize in uh, transplant, renal transplant, kidney transplants as well. So it's a lot, a lot of uh, such specialization, but uh, a lot of the urological issues are very general. So all of us treat that actually. So that's what we call mm. general urology. So all urologists can treat UTI, can treat stones, can treat cancers in general. 
yeah so um um uh, but there are some operations that are a little bit more rare where this subspecialization does matter mm, okay thank you okay so another question is uh during the treatment of prostate cancer stage four um, can the patient survive? Uh, how many years does the patient have um, until? Uh, how many years does the patient have to survive mm, until yeah. death? Mm. Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, stage four means it's uh, spread beyond the original organ, uh, beyond mm. the original uh, uh, organ involved, be it the prostate or the kidney or the bladder, and uh, that's unfortunately the last stage. Um, fortunately. Uh, Fortunately, as I mentioned earlier, we do have a lot of new treatment modalities available, including immunotherapy. All these novel agents do extend a patient's life, uh, but it is still mm. the last stage. And uh, it's rather hard to comment on life expectancy because um, I don't have all the relevant clinical details available. So I do wish this person all the best that's asking the questions uh, in the comment section. But I, I would uh, like to unfortunately decline to comment too much in detail because I don't have the full clinical information. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So the question is, can prostate cancer stage one and two be treated with radiotherapy? Mm, yes, it can. Yes, it's curative as well. So these are all the various options available for stage one and two uh, prostate cancer, active surveillance, a radical prostatectomy, as well as a radiotherapy. They're all curative. Um, I wanted to elaborate a little bit on active surveillance, but I wasn't sure whether I was going to run out of time. Um, mm. Active surveillance means that uh, we are monitoring the uh, patient's uh, PSA blood test level as well as uh, potentially repeating a biopsy of the prostate uh, six months to one year later. And this is when we say we're curative intent, meaning we are trying to delay definitive treatment, which refers to either uh, the prostatectomy or the radiotherapy. And that's because probably this person doesn't have very much symptoms from the prostate cancer and, mm. and it was probably picked up from health screening. Um, and so we know that all these definitive therapies potentially might have side effects. Uh, and so if we delay the treatment, uh, we hopefully can avoid the side effects associated with all these definitive uh, treatments. And we can do this for prostate cancer because it's a little bit more special compared to the other cancers. It, a proportion of prostate cancers are what we call slow growing or indolent and uh, mm. they don't uh, increase um, um, the chances that someone might have um, uh, they, they are not as aggressive, they don't spread as fast, and hence, they are not as life-threatening. So, mm. but not everybody is uh, suitable for active surveillance. We do have to see what the tumour grade in the tumour stage is as well. Okay, since we're on this topic, there's also another mm. question. Uh, why can there be cancers uh, which cells are magnelian and not? Uh, sorry, I don't get it. Say that again. So, uh, why can there be cancers which um, are magnelian and not? Okay, so when we say tumors, uh, we actually refer to both benign and malignant tumors. So some growths are actually uh, benign, meaning they don't spread uh, aggressively to other parts of the body. Uh, and they just stay in one spot. They don't move. Mm. So they are benign. Okay. Yeah. Mm, um, okay whereas okay. malignant, malignant uh, tumors are cancers. And unfortunately, they can be aggressive and spread to other parts of the body. Okay. Okay, so... Um... There is also another question. Um, if there is a patient with PSA of seven and the doctor said that it's stage four uh, can cancer, prostate cancer, how do you tell that uh, PSA is a uh, indication of the stage of cancer and understand the PSA during chemotherapy? Uh, so PSA is not uh, something that we would use in alone to. Uh, to decide what stage a cancer is. So mm. when I say stage, I mean whether it has spread to uh, beyond the original uh, location. Like for example, whether it's in the prostate, spread to outside the prostate, such as to the nearby uh, seminal vesicles, which are just behind the prostate. Uh, whether it's spread to the lymph nodes and whether it's spread to the liver, the lungs, the bones. So that is determined usually by scans. And it's not determined by uh, PSA level alone. Although when we decide on um, treatment for someone with uh, stage 4 cancer, the PSA does matter. Um, but it's not the only thing that we take into account. So it's a little bit more complicated than that. Mm, okay. Uh, so maybe just uh, one last question. Um, and I think it's also a good summary. How can mm. I prevent neurological cancers? Okay. So it's... 
it's not easy. Um, so uh, as I mentioned, or I alluded to earlier, our diet in Singapore certainly doesn't help. Um, so try and take more fruits, vegetables, um, uh, more antioxidants in general. Uh, avoid taking excessive uh, oily, fatty food. Uh, try and exercise um, at least uh, two or three times a week. Even I find that hard to do during COVID-19 um, because all well, gyms are closed. Uh, how to do yeah. exercise? You know? Yeah, we so do a home it's, workout. Yeah, so it's, it's easy to say, but I, I of course I struggle to to exercise as well. Um, but if you can, I, I I definitely salute you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> but all these are the general things that uh, one can try and achieve. Okay. So uh, thank you so much for all of your answers. Thank you all. This is um, so our Q&A session will come to an end. And thank you, Dr. Trisha, for all of the answers that you have given. Um, and thank you for joining us here today. Thank you, Emiko. Thanks for facilitating. No problem. Okay, so before we end, we will share some updates. We will be having a Facebook Live Health Talk next Saturday, 2nd October, 8 p.m. on lung cancer by Dr. Tan Chi Seng from Encore Care Cancer Center, and it will be held in English. So do mark down this date on your calendars, and we hope to see you then. Do remember also to like and share our social media platforms for both for both 365 Cancer Prevention Society, as well as Thomson Medical Center. We would really value and appreciate your feedback from today's session. So please help us to fill up this form by scanning the QR code. So we have now come to the end of our Facebook Live. Thank you all for tuning in tonight and we hope that it was an informative and insightful session for all of you. So do stay safe and have a good evening. Goodbye.